Hello, I'm Richard Young, your host with Facundo Batista and Lana Fayan for MIT's course on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, and the pandemic. We've now heard experts discuss the pandemic, the coronavirus, and what happens to the COVID patient. We've also heard an overview of the immune response, but we've not fully explored the critical functions of the key cell type that regulates the immune response, the T cell. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from one of the world's experts on T cells, Dr. Arlene Sharp. Dr. Sharp is the George Fabian Professor of Comparative Pathology at Harvard Medical School. She is also the chair of the Department of Immunology at Harvard, a member of the Department of Pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, a member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, leader of the Cancer Immunology Program at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, co-director of the Evergrande Center for Immunologic Diseases at Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. Dr. Sharp has been elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. She is co-leader of the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, established this March by Harvard Medical School to respond to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and to prepare for emerging pathogens of the future. Arlene, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's truly my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this wonderful course. Um, in order to preserve my bandwidth, I'm going to stop my video um, for this presentation. Um, and let me see. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can you see my slides? I'm going to put them in slide mode here. Perfect. OK. Very good. OK, well, hi, everyone. Today I'm going to talk with you about T cells. And in my lecture today, I'm first going to talk about regulation of T cell responses, essentially what turns T cells on and turns them off and why that's important. And then we'll talk a bit about the roles of T cells in defense against pathogens, microbes that cause disease. And then we'll focus on what we're learning about T cell responses to COVID-19, which is very much a work in progress. So I know you've had lectures on many topics and you had an overview of the immune system, but many of you have a variety of backgrounds. So I just first want to remind you of a few terms. First, the immune system of an individual is really amazing. It has the ability to recognize anywhere from 10 million to 1,000 million different substances that are referred to in the language of immunology as antigens. Now these antigens are recognized by lymphocytes and lymphocytes have on their receptors, on their surfaces receptors to recognize these antigens. B cells have B cell receptors, T cells have T cell receptors. There are several classes of lymphocytes that are summarized on this slide. There are B cells that are cells that become antibody producing cells and you're gonna have a whole lecture on B cells. Today, we're gonna to focus on the T cells and these T cells come in several types. There are so-called helper T cells and these cells produce cytokines, small proteins that are able to help other types of immune cells become activated that are important in host defense. There also are cytolytic T lymphocytes these lymphocytes are able to recognize infected cells that express microbial antigens and then actually kill these infected cells. There are also regulatory T cells that suppress immune responses. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about regulation of responses and why do we need regulation? So just to talk a little bit more about these types of T cells that kill infected cells. We have a very limited number of T cells that can recognize a specific antigen. And so when we 
when we encounter a pathogen and you have an antigen specific T cell, this cell needs to become activated and then it can expand many, many times. Studies have shown that a T lymphocyte can expand more than 50,000 fold in just one week. Such a rapid response is needed to defend us against infections, but also means that this response needs to be carefully regulated. So you get the appropriate immune response activation in response to a virus at the right time and not um, indeterminately. When we think about an immune response, these, lymph active, these antigen specific lymphocytes need to become activated. Then these cells proliferate and they can differentiate into cells that carry out effector functions for example, for T cells, these killer T cells. Once the pathogen is eliminated, there is dec a decline known as homeostasis that occurs. And then one of the features that's very special about the immune system is that it remembers this encounter with the pathogen. So the next time it encounters, for example, a virus, it's able to respond more quickly because you have these memory T cells. So there are passive mechanisms that control these phases. Once the microbe is eliminated, the infection is over and the stimulus is gone. But there are also active mechanisms. And we're going to spend some time talking about these active mechanisms. So why are these mechanisms important? We need to have control of T cell responses to control the activation of these T cells so you, the cells are appropriately activated. But you also want to control the length of the response and have resolution of the response appropriately. Otherwise, there may be tissue damage. In addition, there's certain situations, for example, certain chronic viral infections, such as HIV, where the antigens can persist for a long period of time. In addition, one of the most amazing aspects of the immune system is the wall it can defend us against the diversity of the microbial world, a normal immune system doesn't respond to self. And so we tolerate ourself and a breakdown of tolerance can lead to autoimmunity. So we need to have these appropriate control mechanisms so that we do not develop immune mediated diseases. We're first going to talk about co-stimulation, which is an important regulator of this balance between T lymphocyte activation. So you get the appropriate response against pathogens and control. So we don't get a response to self, to cells in our own bodies, and we get a controlled response to the pathogen. So we'll first talk about co-stimulation and T cell activation. For T cells to become activated, they need to receive two signals that are delivered by antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells. The first signal confers specificity to an immune response and involves antigen recognition. Antigenic peptides are presented by MHC molecules expressed on the antigen presenting cells to the T cell receptor. In order for a full T cell activation, a co-signal, a second signal known as the co-stimulatory signal is needed. And when the T cell receives both of these signals, it can go on to become activated and differentiate into effector T cells that then can deal with the pathogen. And so these two signals are optimal for T cell activation. There has been much research in this area and our understanding of co-stimulation has evolved over time. So we now appreciate that there are not only positive second signals that work with the T cell receptor to promote T cell activation, but there also are negative second signals that attenuate signals through the T cell receptor. We've learned that many of these negative, these inhibitory second signals are important for mediating tolerance that protect us against autoimmunity. 
these co-stimulatory signals control a variety of T cells at different stages of their life. We have naive T cells that are controlled by co-stimulatory signals, effector T cells, memory T cells, and those regulatory T cells that I mentioned inhibit T cell responses. And there are many T cell co-stimulatory pathways and co-inhibitory pathways. And we're going to focus just on two pathways today, which are key immunoregulatory pathways. The first is the pathway that involves the B7 molecules, B71 and B72, and their receptors, CD28 and CTLA4. So the B7 molecules, also known as CD80 and CD86, are upregulated on antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells when their danger is sensed by the immune system. For example, microbes or components of microbes, such as bacterial cell wall components like lipopolysaccharide, can lead to the expression of these B7 molecules on dendritic cells. These two B7 molecules have overlapping function, but differ in their kinetics of expression. And these molecules can interact with CD28, which is constitutively expressed on the surface of T lymphocytes. And they also can interact with CTLA4. Now, CD28 is constitutively expressed, but in contrast, CTLA4 is upregulated on T cells upon their activation. Whereas CD28 is expressed at the cell surface, CTLA4 is mainly expressed in the cytoplasm and they get shuttled to the cell surface. So CTLA4 is expressed and gets to the surface on activated T cells. And studies have shown that CTLA4 is the high affinity receptor for B71 and B72. So first we'll talk about the function of CD28. CD28 is the major stimulatory receptor that activates naive T cells. When a T cell receives signals through the T cell receptor or through the antigen and through binding of the B7 molecules through CD28, the T cell receives these two signals and signals through CD28 provide growth factors, survival factors, and bioenergetics that allows these T cells to be able to divide and proliferate and then differentiate into effector cells. So signals through CD28 lead to the synthesis of growth factors like IL-2 by the T cells, survival factors like BCL2, and then glucose metabolism that provides the energy for these cells to be able to divide. What about CTLA-4? CTLA-4 has structural similarities to CD28 and is adjacent to CD28 on the chromosome. In early studies, it was a debate whether CTLA-4 was a stimulatory molecule like CD28 or whether it might be an inhibitory molecule. My lab together with the lab of TAC-MAC made CTLA-4 knockout mice. And the phenotype of these mice convinced the field that CTLA-4 was a key inhibitory molecule. These animals die at three to four weeks of age. They develop massively enlarged spleens known as splenomegaly and enlarged lymphocytes known as lymphadenopathy. The T cells in these animals become activated spontaneously and they infiltrate many different tissues and lead to tissue destruction. So here on the left, we're looking at the heart of one of these animals. All of these little purple cells are lymphocytes. And when we have inflammation, we refer to it as an itis. So there's a myocarditis, inflammation and destruction of the heart. And also on the right here, we're looking at a pancreas. There's been complete destruction of the islets here that are important for producing insulin. So we have a pancreatitis. So this phenotype demonstrated that CTLA-4 had a critical role in inhibiting T cell responses and in down-regulating T cell activation. 
And so this pathway then, when we think about this pathway, there's a balance between activation mediated by B7 engagement of CD28 and inhibition mediated by B7 engagement of CTLA-4. How this occurs isn't completely understood, but differences in timing and kinetics help us understand this. That first on when we have a resting situation, there's very little B7 molecules, but then when dangerous signals such as a bacterial pathogen is encountered, there's upregulation of these B7 molecules. They then can engage CD28 that will lead to T cell activation. As a result of T cell activation, CTLA4 becomes upregulated on these cells. CTLA4 is the high affinity receptor. And when, this, when they engage, are engaged by B7, this can then downregulate the T cell response. How does CTLA4 exert its inhibitory functions? CTLA4 can be expressed on a variety of types of T cells. And this cartoon illustrates two ways by which CTLA-4 can inhibit T cell functions. First, CTLA-4 has what's re been referred to as a cell intrinsic function, meaning that cells that express CTLA-4 deliver signals into those cells. And so within cells that express CTLA-4, CTLA-4 signals can block signals through the T cell receptor and through CD28 and thereby inhibit T cell activation. Regulatory T cells, those suppressive T cells also highly express CTLA-4 and CTLA-4 on these regulatory cells can pull B7 molecules out of the membrane of antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells. As a result, there are reduced numbers of these B7 molecules and they're not present to interact with CD28. So there's reduced co-stimulation through CD28 and that also downregulates T cell function. What is the significance of the role of CTLA-4 in downregulating these immune responses? The phenotype of CTLA-4 knockout mice resembled autoimmune disease and led us and others to ask whether CTLA-4 had a role in regulating tolerance and autoimmunity. And so just first, when we think about the immune response, going back to what I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, shutting off immune responses is important for the proper functioning of the immune system. We need to get activation of these cells, but once a pathogen is cleared, we need to return the immune system to its basal state, referred to once again as homeostasis. We also need to prevent inappropriate response to self antigens, which is known as tolerance. And so, as you may have heard earlier, when antigen receptors are generated and T cells are born in the thymus, these receptors are in developing lymphocytes. The expression of these antigen receptors is random without any specificity for whether these T cells can recognize self or foreign substances. So all individuals can produce lymphocytes whose receptors can see self antigens. And these self antigens don't hide from the immune system. So there is a way to deal with them first in the thymus where T cells are born, some of these lymphocytes that recognize self are eliminated. However, some of these lymphocytes get into the periphery and there are also peripheral mechanisms that either can eliminate or inactivate these cells to prevent autoimmunity. So just a little more terminology here, I've used the term autoimmunity and so what I mean by this are immune responses against self or autoantigens. And by implication, these responses are ones that cause disease. And there are diseases that are classified under these immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. And when we think about autoimmunity, this can be throughout the body systemic, such as lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, or organ specific, such as type one diabetes, an autoimmune disease that occurs in the pancreas. 
So people have studied the function of CTLA-4 and autoimmunity. And we've learned that indeed CTLA-4 regulates tolerance and autoimmunity. CTLA-4 can control the function of those is suppressive regulatory T cells and also limit the function of self-reactive effector cells. Long before we had the whole genome sequenced, when we had genome-wide association studies, work from John Todd and Linda Wicker identified polymorphisms in the CTLA-4 gene and associated these with human autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes. We've also learned that there are mutations that occur naturally but are rare in CTLA-4, such as these listed here, work from Mike Leonardo and Gulbu Uzel at the NIH called chai and latte, which are mutations. The first is a mutation in CTLA-4 that's associated with autoimmunity. And the second is a mutation in the protein that shuttles CTLA-4 to the cell surface, LRBA, and these individuals will develop features of autoimmunity as well. This understanding of CTLA-4 as an inhibitory molecule has been translated to therapy, work from Jim Allison, who was the winner of the Nobel Prize last year, appreciated that since CTLA-4 inhibits T cell activation and CTLA-4 blockade can enhance T cell responses, that it might be possible to block CTLA-4 and enhance T cell responses against tumors. And this is illustrated in this cartoon. There are therapeutic antibodies to CTLA-4 that have been developed. These antibodies bind to CTLA-4. So B7 molecules can no longer engage CTLA-4. And so there's unopposed stimulation of B7 molecules engaging CD28. And this can promote immune responses. And this has been indeed translated to therapy, anti-CTLA-4 therapy for cancer. There are many co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory pathways. And I'd like to talk about just one other pathway, which is also a key inhibitory pathway, the pathway that involves PD-1. And I'll use this cartoon to introduce the PD-1 pathway. So the PD-1 receptor is upregulated on T cells upon their activation, similar to CTLA-4. And when PD-1 is engaged by either of its ligands, PD-L1 or PD-L2, it becomes phosphorylated on tyrosine motifs in its cytoplasmic domain. And this can lead to the association of protein tyrosine phosphatases such as SHIP2, which then can dephosphorylate kinases downstream of the T cell receptor or CD28. As a result, there are reduced signaling through the T cell receptor and CD28 and reduced T cell responses, reduced cytokine production by T cells and reduced killing by those cytolytic T cells. Now, one of the fascinating aspects of this pathway lies in the expression pattern of its ligands. And in particular, the expression of PDL1 really captured our attention when we first discovered that PDL1 and PDL2 were binding partners for PD1, and that these molecules can be expressed on a variety of types of hematopoietic cells, such as antigen presenting cells. But PDL1 in particular can be expressed on a number of types of non hematopoietic cells, such as the blood vessels, a variety of types of epithelial cells, muscle cells, liver cells, islet cells in the pancreas, cells in the placenta and the eye. This tissue expression pattern suggested to us that this pathway might control T cell responses locally within tissues. And indeed, that is the case. We've learned that interferons are potent stimuli for upregulating PDL1 and PDL2. And so this is a way by which the immune system can naturally downregulate the immune responses 
once you get T cells activated, these cytokines become elaborated. And part of the counterpoint and counterbalance here is that these cytokines will upregulate these ligands, which then can also serve to tune down immune responses. When I think about the PD-1 pathway, it's really a poster child for why we have inhibitory signals in the immune system. This pathway is a counterbalance to positive signals through the T cell receptor and CD28. PD-1, like CTLA-4, these inhibitory signals are also important for mediating tolerance. And in addition, PD-L1 expression in the tissues has an important role for and it allows these pathway to have an important role in resolving inflammation. PDL1 on non hematopoietic tissue cells, so cells in the tissues express PDL1, and this can control resolution of inflammation and also protect tissues from autoimmune attack. In addition, it's the smartest immunologists, the microbes in the tumors, that over and over again have exploited this pathway to evade eradication by the immune system. This pathway contributes to T cell dysfunction, a process known as exhaustion that can develop during chronic viral infection and also cancer. Now, what is T cell exhaustion? This is a dysfunctional state which is defined by poor effector T cell function. So the cells don't kill as well, don't make cytokines as well. These cells express high levels of PD-1 and other inhibitory receptors. And this is a unique transcriptional and epigenetic state. Just to compare acute and chronic infection, here we have a viral infection, say like influenza virus. The virus is encountered by the immune system and the naive T cells become activated as we've discussed. These cells then can differentiate into effector cells that are cells that can kill the infected cells and then the virus is cleared and then we get a memory response. In contrast, there are some infections like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, a mouse model that's used widely is lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus known as LCMV. And the situation in cancer where you have tumor antigens that are chronic is quite similar. In this situation where you have persistent antigen, these chronically stimulated cells go into, they sink into progressively into states of T cell exhaustion. First, the cells lose the ability to make IL-2, then they lose the ability to make certain cytokines and become poorer killers. And these cells, some of them can fade away. We're learning now that there are distinct populations of these cells. This understanding of PD-1 and T cell exhaustion was first described in this LCMV infection model. And here, what we're looking at is there's a form of LCMV that causes an acute infection like influenza. The infection occurs, but then is cleared. And so here, if we look at the black circles, what you can see is that during acute infection, PD-1 expression goes up, but then as the virus is cleared, PD-1 expression will go back down. During chronic infection, PD-1 goes up, but it stays high. And what we've learned is that these cells that highly express PD-1 are exhausted and less functional and work from Rafi Ahmed, John Weary, Dan Barber, and Gordon Freeman showed that blockade of this pathway could revive the function of these exhausted cells. So the chronic infection could be reduced the viral burden by many logs. And what I want you to take away from this is that both activated T cells and exhausted cells can express PD-1. So you cannot tell whether a cell is recently activated or whether it's exhausted by PD-1 expression alone. One needs to look at these cells and study them more deeply. This part of the pathway has also been translated to therapy. 
if one blocks this inhibitory signal, this can promote anti-tumor immunity. So tumor cells themselves, as well as tissue cells, can express PDL1. And antibody drugs have been developed to either PD1 or PDL1 that block this interaction. And this can unleash a potent anti tumor response. So these CTLs, these CD8 T cells, are able to now once again kill and elaborate cytokines. And this has also been translated to therapy in that blockers of PD1 have been approved by 22 different types of or for 22 different types of cancer. I'd now like to turn to a discussion of the roles of T cells in defending us against infection. So when we think about the immune response to an acute viral infection, we can think about this in phases. So we have the infection and then we have as a result of the stimulation the immune cells are activated, the T cells are activated, they expand, they differentiate, they then can deal with the virus, so the viral load will go down and the virus is cleared. We then have what's referred to as a contraction phase and a transition to memory. And so we're looking over time here, this can take a period of typically weeks and these memory cells can last for years. So when we think about the sequence events for the development of these effector T cell responses, we have antigen recognition, as we've talked about, and these naive T cells or B cells can become activated, and these cells will then proliferate and then differentiate into effector cells and, so, and to memory cells. And so we're first going to talk about effector CD4 cells and what they can do, and then effector CD8 cells, which are the cells that become killer cells and what they're capable of doing. So first, these naive CD4 cells are capable of differentiating into different subsets. And these subsets are able to recruit and activate different types of cells with which they can collaborate to combat different types of infections. So as shown on this slide, there are effector cells that are Th1 cells that make the cytokine interferon gamma as the defining cytokine of these cells. That the principal target of interferon gamma are macrophages and as a result of interferon, these cells, the macrophages will have receptor to be able to bind interferon gamma. And then there are signals that go into these macrophages that activate these macrophages. So then they can deal with intracellular microbes and kill these microbes. The Th2 cells make different cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And these cytokines are able to activate different types of immune cells, eosinophils, mast cells, and certain types of macrophages. And this type of immune defense is important in particular for certain types of parasites and worms, these helminths. We also have Th17 cells that produce IL-17 and IL-22. And these are able to recruit neutrophils and activate them. And these neutrophils are able to deal with extracellular bacteria as well as fungi. Finally, there are T follicular helper cells, abbreviated as TFH. These cells can make cytokines that include IL-21, and they also can make interferon or IL-4. And these target B cells. And the TFH cells work together with B cells and can lead to antibody production. And antibodies are very important for dealing with extracellular pathogens or extracellular forms of a, vi of a of, for example, a virus. So antibodies are important for dealing with the viral particles and can prevent antibodies can prevent the virus from binding to and infecting a cell. And I think your next lecture is talking, going to talk a lot more about the properties of antibodies. 
but we also have ways to, in the CTL that we'll talk about next, are important for killing cells that are become infected. But first we'll talk a little bit more. I'm gonna focus here on time only permits me to talk about one set of these cells in depth. And I'm gonna talk about the T follicular helper cells because the interactions between helper cells and T helper T cells and B cells is important for antibody for defense. And then we'll go on to talk about cytotoxic T cells. So on this cartoon, what we're doing are outlining the steps and stages for interactions of helper CD4 T cells with B cells that are needed for antibody production. So initially we have activation of these helper T cells with antigen and co-stimulation as we've already discussed that allow these cells to differentiate into effector T cells. And this initial activation occurs in the T cell zone. And so you get got antigen recognition and co-stimulation. At the same time, in the follicles, the antigen is brought, the same antigen is brought there and these B cells become activated. As a result of the activation of the T cells and the B cells, they're able to migrate toward each other and interact. And so when these cells interact, it's the interactions between these cells and signals between them that allow the initial signals that initiate the antibody response. As a result, outside the follicle, we have these short-lived plasma cells that develop, but then some of these cells migrate back into the follicle where they form the germinal center. And these specialized T follicular helper cells can interact with B cells there and allow these B cells then to become long-lived plasma cells and memory B cells. I know Michelle Newsom's wife talked in depth about these cells, but I just want to focus on one aspect of these cells and talk about TB collaboration and helper CD4 mediated activation of these B cell lymphocytes. That when these cells interact, as we've discussed, that these activated helper T cells will express a molecule called CD40 ligand that gets upregulated on the surface of these activated cells. And they also produce cytokines. And then the B cells, when they interact, they have receptors where they can receive signals through these cytokines. And also CD40 is engaged um, when the ligand for it from the T cells binds to CD40 on the B cell. As a result of these signals, these interactions between CD40 and CD40 ligand are very important for B cell proliferation and differentiation. And we know this because there are diseases, there are mutations in the gene for CD40 ligand or CD40. And, and this can result in a hyper IgM syndrome. Mutations in the gene for CD40 ligand result in a disease that is characterized by defects in antibody production where you don't get switching to isotypes like IgG and you don't get maturation of the immunoglobulin response. And we also know this from studies in, in mice that have mutations in CD40 or CD40 ligand. So these interactions between the CD4 cells and the B lymphocytes is critical for getting the maturation and activation of the, of the B cell response that occurs. I'd now like to turn to CD8 cells. These are the cells that are the ones that can develop to kill infected cells. And so just sort of giving you an overview first of these responses, both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses occur within a lymphoid organ, such as a lymph node. You have antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cell that are going to carry the viral antigens into the lymph node where interactions between 
um, the T cell receptor on, and the B7 molecules on these dendritic cells with naive CD8 T cells will lead to their activation, their proliferation, and then differentiation into effector cells. And these differentiated effector cells then enter the circulation and can migrate back to sites of initial infection where these CTLs can then kill the infected cells, which are referred to as target cells. So it's important that for you to know that these naive CD8 T cells do not kill infected cells, that these cells need to differentiate into the mature effector cells. And when this differentiation process occurs, these mature cytolytic T cells acquire the machinery that allow these cells to lyse the and kill the infected cells. Now, cell killing is antigen specific. It's the same peptide MHC antigen that triggered these CD8 cells to differentiate into these killer cells that's, requiring for, that's required for triggering killing by these mature differentiated CTL. Now, these cytolytic T cells have two major functions. The first is direct killing of infected cells, and the second is secretion of inflammatory cytokines. These inflammatory cytokines are important in the function of the CTL, but they also can work to activate macrophages. So there's a partnership by different types of cells to defend us against microbes. How is it that these cells do exert their functions? And this cartoon shows that when there is antigen recognition of an infected target cell here by a CTL, um, that these cells bind very tightly. There are integrins on the surface of, of these cells that lead to a stable interaction, such as interactions between LFA1 and Ike. CAM, for example, these CTLs then become activated and they have, that leads to exocytosis of granules in these cells. And these granules contain granzymes and perforin. Perforin makes pores in the membranes of the target cell, of the infected cell. And then these granzymes are able to enter the cell and they can lead to death of these cells. So a process that leads to cell death, killing of infected cells by these activated CTL. Finally, I'd like to turn to T cell responses in COVID-19. This is very much a work in progress. The type of work that's going on is to characterize virus-specific CD4 cells and CD8 cells across the spectrum of disease in hospitalized patients, in patients who recover the convalescent individuals, as well as asymptomatic individuals. Work is going on to define the T cell specificities what is it about the virus that the CD4 and CD8 T cells see? And work is going on to correlate the phenotypes of these T cells with the spectrum of disease. First, there is work that has gone on to and defined lymphopenia. This is an abnormal reduction in lymphocyte numbers that has been associated with severe disease but this resolves when patients recover. Lymphopenia has been reported to affect CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, B cells, as well as natural killer cells. The mechanisms are not yet clear. It may be a direct effect of high levels of cytokines such as TNF, but it also could be due to hyperactivation, hyperstimulation of T cells or high levels of expression of molecules that can cause the death of these T cells. Work from one of the previous lecturers, Dr. Shiv Palai, has been studying severely ill patients who had COVID-19 
who unfortunately succumb to disease. And when they studied cells from these individuals, they found that in contrast to individuals who were not infected, there was a marked decrease in B cell numbers and T cell numbers in lymph nodes from these individuals who passed away, as well as the spleen reduced B cell and T cell numbers. Another thing that was found, and, and I think Dr. Pillai talked a bit about this last time from the perspective of innate immunity, is that in these individuals who passed away from severe infection, they found that there was a blunting of the germinal center response. And this is likely leading to a dampening of the generation of long-lived antibodies. What is found is that there was a complete loss of germinal centers in the lymph nodes and spleens of these individuals with severe COVID-19, and that there was a block in the development of these T follicular helper cells, which are important for generation of these germinal center responses and B cells. There was an increase in these Th1 cells that produce cytokines, and there also were a lot of TNF production and TNF secretion of macrophages, which may contribute to this defective response. Um, more work is needed, but this is certainly illuminating and helping us understand some of the defects that are seen in patients with very severe disease. Other work is ongoing from individuals with less severe disease, and the types of studies are illustrated here, where people are asking, what is it that T cells, CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells see, that T cells are taken from patients who, in this case, patients who recovered from disease, patients who are asymptomatic, for example, and they're able to take these T cells and then look at what portions of proteins of, of the virus are seen and identify them. And this type of work, work that just came online this last month in immunity, for example, have shown that about 90% of the proteins that are of epitopes, that means portions of antigen that are seen, are not the spike protein, but it looks as though other proteins, such as the nucleocapsid protein, as well as membrane and other open reading frames, are the targets. And they found that the CD8 T cells from these individuals did not show cross reactivity with the seasonal coronaviruses. In addition, a recent paper that just was published and came online last week in Cell um, was looking at a variety of patients or individuals who were infected, those with very severe disease who passed away, those who recovered, those with mild disease, those who recovered from mild disease, exposed family members, some of whom were asymptomatic, and then they also looked at blood donors. And they looked in a variety of ways, using flow cytometry to look at the phenotype, using ELISPOT to look at some of the functions of these cells, and correlating this with um, types of disease and, what, and, and phenotype of disease. And what they found is that in the acute infection, there are T cells that can display an activated cytotoxic phenotype and that in convalescent individuals, when they study these T cells, they stimulate them in vitro, they can produce, for example, multiple cytokines, and on their surface, they have markers of memory. Interestingly, they have found SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells in people who do not have antibodies, suggesting that antibodies alone may underestimate the extent of infected individuals. So as I mentioned, this is very much a work in progress. More and more papers are being published literally every day. Um, I, I have here two recent reviews that I think are very thoughtful, one from Corolla Vinuesa that was published in Cell in October, one from John Wary in his lab that was published in Nature Reviews Immunology as well. 
And so to summarize, we're really at a very early stage of understanding T cell responses to COVID-19. We de are detecting CD4 and CD8 T cells with markers of memory. These have been detected in 100% CD4 cells of people who have recovered and 70% of CD of uh, uh, CD8 cells are seen in these patients and individuals who recovered. Memory T cells have been detected um, that respond to multiple proteins of SARS-CoV-2, not only the spike protein, but also, for example, the nucleoprotein and membrane protein. In different studies, it appears that CD8 T cell responses are mainly to internal proteins rather than the spike protein. What's been observed is a particularly high frequency of CD4 cells that can see the viral spike protein in patients who've recovered. But it, we need more work to understand whether the presence of the, how to interpret the presence of these cells. It's not yet clear whether these cells are providing protective immunity, and that work is going to take time. In addition, as I mentioned, there's been recent work with virus-specific T cells being detected in antibody seronegative individuals. And these were family members of people who developed SARS-CoV-2 infection and in convalescent individuals. And so it work, further work is needed to understand how to interpret this. And then finally, as one reads papers, some studies are showing and from the earliest days that there are many cells that are seen that express high levels of these inhibitory receptors such as PD-1 and CTLA-4. And some people are referring to these cells as exhaustion-like. In preparation for this lecture, I talked to one of the experts who's been studying these cells because, and asked him how he interprets this. Are these cells, as I mentioned, recently activated or are they dysfunctional? And his feeling is that these cells are predominantly very activated cells. As I mentioned, during activation, you can have high levels of these inhibitory receptors that are upregulated. But further work is needed. He said that as he's done transcriptional profiling on some of these cells, that they do have some features of transcriptional profiles of exhausted cells. So really, this is very much a work in progress. But, and, but I think this work provides us hope that there can be memory T cells that develop, and we need to understand more about the functions of these cells. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and turn my video back on. Happy to answer questions. I think we have a few minutes left. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharp. We do have a few questions. Uh, the vaccines, as you noted, that are under development are focused on the spike protein. And you pointed out that T cells are often recognizing additional portions of the virus. Do you think this is a problem? So I think vaccines are gonna be very important for developing protective immunity, because as the work from Shiv Palai's lab has indicated that in severe patients, we're not gonna be able to develop a good antibody response. It seems as though most of the CD4 cells are directed against the spike protein, so that's good news. But I think this also informs us that to develop a more of a response, we may want to think more broadly about uh, developing responses to other proteins as well. Do you think T cell responses might contribute to the rogue immune response, the cytokine storm, for example, that's observed in a subset of patients? That's a very good question. It's possible that the T cells can contribute. The innate immune system certainly has an important role in this as well, that we know that cytokines made by cells of the innate immune system, they elaborate lots of interferons and TNF very early. So it could be that those cells are the ones that are predominantly leading to cytokine storm, but I think T cells also have the potential to contribute. Some patients um, that are infected with this virus are also suffering from cancer. And there's some curiosity about whether 
we know anything about the response to viral infection when patients are on therapies that modulate the immune response in cancer? So that's a very good question. There has been very little published on that as present. Um, work that has been published has indicated that cancer patients still can respond to immunotherapies. In some of the patients that I mentioned where there are high levels of these inhibitory receptors, that's been observed in certain patients, especially with hematologic malignancies, suggesting that it may be different in certain types of cancer patients who are maybe some of the ones who are most vulnerable to this infection. And so further work is needed as we begin to understand how different types of comorbidities, um, cancer, age, obesity, other things will impact the immune response to COVID-19. And one more question. You talked about T cell exhaustion, but why don't pathogens evolve that directly suppress CTLA-4 or PD-1? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think that this is part of a response that develops um, because we know if we don't have CTLA-4 or PD-1, that these pathogens can upregulate the ligands for PDL1. Tumors are very clever in that they can upregulate the ligands and defend themselves as well. But if we lack PD1, the PD1 pathway in mouse models, when you give the animal an infection with a form of LCMV that causes chronic infection, they die trying to clear the infection. So it's balanced pathogenicity, if you will. The virus is able to survive and find another host to replicate so that there is a limited damage to the, immune, to the uh, host. Arlene, thank you so much for being with us today. Truly my pleasure. Thank you again.